All right, so we are joined in the HQ for the DFS portion of Saturday's video, as always, with my man, Joe Holko. What's going on, Joe? What's going on, Nick? Uh, yeah, we didn't get the, the video last week, so sorry about that, guys. Uh, but uh, I think we'll, we'll have some good stuff for you guys today to make up for it, hopefully. Yeah, we're going to double down on the energy. We're going to double down on the value, on the content, on the information today. And as Joe, as always, Joe's going to hit you with uh, the best of his knowledge, DFS-wise, because that is his specialty. So we're going to get right into it, not to waste any of y'all's time and uh, taking a look at the slates for this one. We'll, we'll break it down position by position, or if you see a general strategy that you want to attack this week, uh, Joe, you're more than welcome to uh, jump right in at the quarterback position, or if there's anything overlying on week seven, um, feel free to break it down for us. Yeah, it's always interesting as we progress through the season, we're getting a little bit more information than we had earlier, obviously. So um, just something for me that I've been trying to work on a little bit. Uh, so I'll be playing in the 5,300 on DraftKings, which actually spans five weeks. So it's kind of a unique contest they're doing where like it's uh, it's point values. So uh, whoever can uh, do the best in this 100 person field uh, over the course of five weeks uh, wins 100K. So uh, that's kind of what I'm shooting towards. Uh, it's totally different strategy though, because it's, it's not like a GBP where you just have to win in one week. You have to show some consistency. So um, my focus is going to be to stay a little bit more optimal in this. Uh, last week, I still was in the top half, but um, I think that's what you want from that. It, it, it's, if you have a disaster week, that it totally buries you. Uh, so uh, I'm working on that. I'll still be playing the 1500 per usual. Um, but yeah, so a little bit more optimal field than normal, um, at least from my perspective on that single entry team. But uh, at quarterback this week, a lot, uh, I guess, kind of rides on the fact if, if you'd normally get Russell Wilson right, this is probably the, the week to play Russell Wilson. Um, I'm someone that tends to get Russell Wilson wrong. So uh, it does seem like it's a great spot for him. I think he'll be really popular. He's 6,600 on DraftKings, 8,500 on FanDuel. Um, that spot just makes a lot of sense for a lot of those guys. So guys like Tyler Lockett kind of scare me, which we'll, we'll talk about just because game script can kind of uh, completely price him out uh, where he's at on the salary spectrum. So um, if, you, if you don't want to go the, the Russell Wilson route, I, I think someone like Kyler Murray or Josh Allen is kind of what I'm locked into right now that they're all kind of in that mid uh, 6k range I think that's kind of where you want to be at quarterback this week so Josh Allen um, if you think that he can kind of come back uh, after that injury we'll see if we get John Brown back with them as well but if they are both healthy love that stack for sure against Miami um, typically we're trying to stay away from some of these really large spreads but uh, I do think that Josh Allen since he he is going to give us some uh, kind of rushing side of it I, I, I think that he's they'll probably okay. Um, if it's a big spread, it could easily be Josh Allen. That's a big part of it. So I'm on that. Uh, Kyler Murray, um, some, some, someone that I've probably played um, a lot of this year compared to uh, some people, but um, just his floor now that he's starting to throw some touchdowns as well. One, one thing that I'll say in, from a DFS perspective, so I know a lot of you guys are, are in season long as well, uh, primarily. So um, someone like Matt Ryan, like he's probably a very solid, like kind of late round quarterback. Um, I mean, if you have him, you're starting him. Um, in DFS, the difference in getting these guys that rush is is that much more important. So, for example, the last two weeks on my single entry team, I have played Kyler Murray, I've played Lamar Jackson. I haven't gotten a passing touchdown on my main team in two weeks, but I've still had a quarterback that that finished with 25 or more points in both of those weeks. So, um, the floor and ceiling combo of that is, is something that you just can't get with the Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan needs to throw two touchdowns. Maybe he's not a good example because of how how good he's been this year, but he's got to throw two or three touchdowns to get even close to that floor. Um, so I, I prefer to have that, at, um, but there's a lot of great options uh, for that this week. Uh, I think those are the guys you're looking at in cash games for sure. Um, if you wanted to get a little bit different, I think someone like Deshaun Watson will go a little bit uh, kind of uh, under own this week. It's, it's, it is an indie. Um, I, I think that there'll be some popular plays um, on the other side of this game as well. In particular, T.Y. Hilton at wide receiver just because he always smashes Houston. It feels like, uh, but Watson, 8,300, he's pretty expensive. Um, it's like him and Lamar again, like all these guys are, I mean, they're both of them are definitely kind of uh, matchup proof at this point. So if you want to get a little bit different, I could see going that route. If, if you're looking to pay uh, down a little bit further, um, I, I do think that Daniel Jones is in play just because it's against Arizona. The price is really nice there. He's only 7,200 on FanDuel, um, 6,100 on, on DraftKings. So targeting Arizona, I think both quarterbacks in that game make a ton of sense. Uh, so I guess there's there's more options than normal at quarterback this week, but I still think that all these guys that are, are rushing, are, are a lot of them are really good matchups as well, so it could be an interesting slate. What about a, a little bit of Minshew Mania action? I know he's not necessarily a runner, but he gets the Bengals. Um, is this, is yeah. this a spot where, I mean, they're going to be missing William Jackson, they're going to be missing Drake or Patrick, not like either of those guys are really 
you know, big playmakers in the secondary because they didn't really have any playmakers in the secondary up to this point in the season. This Bengals team has just been donating points to opposing offenses. So Minshew's a guy coming off of a down week where a lot of people are probably shying away from him now, but he was very consistent in the weeks prior to um, this past week. And now he gets this matchup with the Bengals. And this could be a week where they end up just riding Fournette to 25, 27 carries, something like that, and not really needing to ask Minshew to do a whole lot. But this is an offense. Well, first of all, this is a defense that's lacking, you know, a lot of the explosiveness that we wanted to see them bounce back with that they had in, you know, 2017. They just don't have it this year. Jalen Ramsey's obviously out of there. And this is an offense throwing the ball at a much higher rate than we probably originally projected them to do so with Fournette. He's still getting a lot of carries, but it's also just getting an overall huge, huge touch count. And that's uh, a lot of the way by reception. So it's like Minchu is kind of um, raking in some extra points via the running back throws, whereas in previous years they may have, um, you know, given the ball to Fournette to, to carry it. So what do you think about Minshew down at, at 5,400? Is he a guy that just doesn't have that rushing floor slash upside um, for, to get yeah. to that? Uh, I like Minshew quite a bit. There's there's a couple of things that make him kind of an appealing play, and you mentioned it, like his price, like he's significantly cheaper than some of the other guys right. we've talked about. Um, he's still going to give you a little bit of rushing, but what, what I do like about it in tournaments in particular is when you mentioned Fournette. Like Fournette's going to be the highest on player on the slate at 7K. I'd be shocked if he's not. Um, so a great strategy in tournaments and DFS is to kind of uh, flip the script. Like how do things go wrong for Fournette? It's if Minshew runs one in, throws a couple. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm in on that at 5,400 for sure. Especially like you said, the matchup against Cincinnati, a team that's going to pass a ton. Uh, we might even see a little bit of a bump in plays for Jacksonville. Um, and yeah, like you said, their defense isn't great either. So maybe a little bit of kind of sneaky shootout upside here, especially with everyone on Fournette. I think Minshew is a great GPP play at that price. Yeah, that makes sense. So in the tournaments that you play, switching over the running back position, you're pretty much saying that Fournette is basically a must play at, at 7Gs? Yeah, I think he's pretty much a lock in cash games at this point. Like, I don't know what it is. DraftKings just doesn't want to pay, like, kind of uh, price him up all the way. Uh, but 7K for a guy that you can pretty easily project to touch the ball uh, 22 to 27, eight times at that point. But he's still seeing the involvement in the passing game that we want. Um, on DraftKings. So I, I'm, I'm locking that in. Uh, I do think that uh, just his red zone involvement, we don't have to worry about someone coming in there and stealing his touchdown. There, there, there's a lot of value in that. At 7K, I prefer him uh, to some of the other guys in his uh, range, like Aaron Jones, with a, a lot more uncertainty there. Um, as far as some of the other guys, definitely keep an eye on uh, Saquon uh, throughout the week if he's going to play. Um, I mean, I still think that him against Arizona is a pretty much a smash spot as well. You're not getting any discounted price there with Saquon. He's 8,900 on DraftKings. Um, and in particular, like him versus Dalvin Cook. Like at this point, I I'm not scared to go back to Dalvin Cook. I, I played Dalvin Cook last week and got burned by that. Um, but I do think that he's still very reasonably priced against, uh, against Detroit this week. Uh, those are kind of the, the volume monsters. We have no Christian McCaffrey on the main slate. Uh, Alvin Kamara, that ankle injury is, I'm, I'm not really attacking a guy like Kamara when he's, when he's that banged up. So I think for me, I think a lot of the ownership is going to go to Fournette. Um, from there, I, I think he's, he's probably one of Dalvin versus Ben Saquon. And then uh, from there, you're, you're trying to figure out if any of these other guys uh, are in play kind of in the mid range that are going to give us some some upside through the air as well. So a couple of guys that I've been looking at, Josh Jacobs at 5K, I think he's intriguing. He's seen uh, a couple, uh, he's seen an uptick in his passes usage, uh, like kind of recently as well. People are kind of forgetting about him after their, their buy and whatnot. Uh, Devonta Freeman at 5,400. Hey, I'm not a big <laughs> Devonta Freeman fan in general, uh, but he is seeing a lot of usage in the passing game. I actually heard someone mention that um, his usage is, is like kind of similar to like almost like a James White in this offense, um, which kind of, uh, I guess gives you a little bit more of a picture of what he is now. Um, carry on Johnson is probably fine. Tough matchup there. 5,100 though, based on his volume, he'll be popping in some models. Uh, Chris Carson at 6,500. Like I mentioned that Russell Wilson is a play that a lot of people will be on this week. I think that Chris Carson still like is probably the guy that ideally want to try and get involved as much as possible. Like he's got 22 or more carries in the last three games, uh, but he's still getting his almost uh, three or four targets through the air as well. So Chris Carson, someone that I probably haven't played enough of this year, um, especially if Penny is out again. I, I think that Carson at 65 is one of those guys that that stands out as being pretty drastically underpriced. Yeah, I was going to say Chris Carson seems like a very, very good play this week. I mean, just in general, he's he's one of the guys that is creeping into that area of like you, you don't sell him in season long leagues because of the amount of carries he's getting in. It's not necessarily like Leonard Fournette, where he's also getting six or seven targets a game. 
but this is a team that's going to continuously just pound the rock with Carson. So those 25 carries are going to turn into, uh, you know, a few things. And I'm sure we'll touch on this with Lockett and possibly Metcalf when we talk about wide receivers. But the fact that Will Disley is gone now, right? Like he is someone who is leading yeah. tight ends in end zone targets. I, I believe he had five on the year with four touchdowns. So there's a lot of opportunity now that's going to go into the hands of someone else because it's not like this offense is going to fall off. The fact that they're still led by Russell Wilson means that those points are still going to be manufactured. They're just going to go elsewhere. And uh, with like Saquon, yeah, I figured Saquon is kind of a must play. I think he's uh, out there practice in, in the full capacity so far. So it seems like he is definitely on track to suit up. They gave him um, a good enough timetable. Thankfully, they didn't rush him back last week when, you know, it was looking like he was a possible game time decision. So they gave him another week of rest. He looks like he should be a full go. I think he just needs to get medical clearance um, in order to actually be good for the games. But otherwise, I think Saquon is probably going to be, or Saquon, excuse me, is, is going to be like a, a very good play as well. Um, that was kind of my main question. I mean, you don't think that they would roll him back until he was like fully healthy, right? Because this Giants team, like the, the, they don't have a ton to play for. I mean, right now, maybe they do. Like, I mean, they're they, a game they, back. They're, they're a game back of the division, actually, believe it or not. So they're they're in the thick of things. Um, I know that that seems like a, like, you know, they're a game back, but like. Not not a great division, I guess, is a, I guess the positive thing there. Yeah. So, I mean, they they definitely feel like they're in the thick of things. I just think it's, I think it's Saquon Barkley. I mean, from like a sign standpoint you know you look at these guys like Peterson and Saquon Barkley yeah. it's like the way they build muscle and the way their body works is mm -hmm. like their cells just recuperate at a different speed than other human beings right so their timetable right. is going to be shortened I'm not a fucking doctor or scientist but that just seems like the way that this things will work for a guy like Saquon so I think he'll be back he keeps saying that he feels fine he's back to 100% he had a high ankle sprain in college and I, I think he came back in two weeks like okay. legit two weeks so <laughs> yeah so he should be good to go against Arizona I mean like you said like DraftKings is giving you no discount on him 8900 is by far and away the, the highest uh salary guy in the running back position on the main slate and then Fournette you brought up 7,000 he is from what I've seen a lot of people's season-long rankings he's basically the RB one or two in like every uh analyst ranking so far so those all seem like guys who need to be um you know in your lineup in one capacity or another uh, switching over to the wide receiver position, you know, and you were talking about how Tyler Lockett might be a tough one to get into your lineup at 6,600, just because from a volume standpoint, he hasn't seen the volume like a guy like Keenan Allen, who's 6,700. He's only a hundred dollars more than Lockett is, but I almost look at um, Disley being out of the lineup as a, as a big potential boost for a guy like Lockett. Now, if you're playing, you know, luckily if you're playing a guy like Fournette at seven, at seven G's and maybe playing, um, I don't know, like uh, you can even do Derrick Henry down at 5,800. I don't think that's a terrible play, but you don't have to pay up for, you know, it's not like paying for a Saquon, a Zeke, and another guy who's, you know, 77 or 7,800. You could, you could probably spend a little bit more on wide receivers. Is that what you're doing this week? Or are you still? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting week at wide receiver. Uh, I do think like what you mentioned with, uh, with Keenan Allen makes some sense. Uh, with my construction, I almost always kind of, kind of end up on um, the mid range wide receivers and some of the cheaper ones. But I mean, if you're paying all the way up, it's still like DeAndre Hopkins will pop off at some point. He's 7,800 against Indy, maybe. Uh, I think people are still going to play Julio, but at, at 8K, um, that's a tougher one for, for me to swallow. Uh, I think uh, having tournament exposure to those guys is fine. But if I'm paying up, it's probably just going to be Cooper Cup, uh, 7,400 against Atlanta. I think that people that got burned by him last week, I, I just think it's a pretty good bounce back spot. For the Rams offense as a whole, um, I'm not really on Jared Goff, but I think grabbing pieces of this game makes sense. Someone like Robert Woods, who his price has really dropped off, but he's still seeing uh, at least reasonable opportunity. I think Cooper Cup's fine, uh, Keenan Allen in that range. Um, but if you're kind of looking for – I don't know if there's really a whole lot else to, to pay all the way up for. You, you did mention um, Tyler Lockett, 6,600. I, I always kind of struggle with Lockett because of what we said before. Like if they do get ahead, they're just going to run. And his price is at a spot where, yeah, He's definitely a guy that could have some upside in tournaments, but he really has to pop off uh, for him to hit value at that point. He's just not really seeing the volume I want to see from a guy uh, that is that price. But like you said, there, there should be some target share theory that opened up with this league not being there. So I think that's fine. I think I prefer, uh, if I'm just taking a shot, just to go with DK Metcalf, 4,800. He's seen those deeper targets. This Baltimore defense really is not that good um, compared to uh, what we projected for them coming into the season. Just another reason to not put a, a lot of weight into uh, matchups before the season, even towards the beginning of the season. Um, so I think that they're, they're interesting. Um, so if you didn't want to go all the way up to someone like Keenan Allen, one of the guys that I think is one of the better plays on the slate is Mike Williams. I mean, he's, he's kind of dominating the receiving opportunity there, like quietly. I mean, at least as far as his, his air yards. So he's almost doubled Keenan Allen in, in terms of his team air yards. Um, I mean, 
I, I do think that he's a guy that uh, like Allen's probably someone that we could buy low on for sure. Um, just because he hasn't really popped off in a while, but I do think Williams, I mean, he's a lot cheaper. Um, I mean, I, I think that he's a, he's a great play at this week at, at that price point. Uh, I think in the mid 4k range, he's the one that's standing out to me. Um, if you did want to kind of uh, hit that in between area, Kenny Galladay, I mean, it is Minnesota. I get that, but 5,800 still underpriced for a guy that's seeing uh, the target share that he is. I mean, he's got eight, I mean, he's got eight or more targets in five straight games. Um, he's hit the hundred yard bonus a couple of times in there as well. Massive red zone usage. Uh, I, I think that he's a guy that still his price is not quite caught up. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the guys that uh, like early, it's still kind of early in the week, but those are the ones that, that I'm on. I think that you could probably um, maybe go to someone uh, if you don't care about uh, wide receiver cornerback matchups at all. I, I've heard some, some Darius Slayton love and GBPs with Patrick <laughs> Peterson coming back, but he's only 4,100. Uh, I, I don't, I probably won't go there myself if I'm going to attack one of those, uh, those wide receiver cornerback matchups. And I do think that like from a season long perspective, it totally makes sense not to play those guys, but in GPPs, if you can get this guy at like crazy low ownership. It, it can make sense at times. Someone like Allen Robinson against Lattimore this week, Allen Robinson's like 5,500, probably uh, priced down um, based on that matchup, but he's going to get, he's super low owned. So if you're looking for a guy that, that could be um, a flyer in tournaments, I think he's fine from an equity perspective in that same range of Allen Robinson. I love John Brown. If he plays with Josh Allen, I mentioned that against Miami, but also T Y Hilton, at 5,900, I think T.Y. Hilton is going to be someone that a lot of people go to in cash games and at the higher stakes as well. Uh, his price uh, at 5,900 seems like he's a great value as well, um, kind of in that same range as Robert Woods that I talked about before. So the mid the mid range at wide receiver seems just packed this week. Uh, the Cardinals wide receiver is almost always in play. Larry Fitzgerald is a much better value on FanDuel. I'm not sure why they don't want to price him up over there. He's actually like the same place price as Christian Kirk over there. Um, on DraftKings, Christian Kirk's like 1100 cheaper. So if we do get him back in this game, um, all the Arizona guys squarely in play against the Giants. Uh, I think that's going to be a, a game that a lot of people will go to in game stacks for sure. Yeah, I mean, a lot to unfold there. I definitely have yeah. um, a, a few defensive notes for some of the guys you mentioned. You said like T.Y. Hilton will probably be a popular play. I mean, we look at the defensive backs for Houston. I mean, not only have they been like really bad and just letting up a ton of points on the defensive side of the ball. Obviously their offense scores a lot of points forcing the uh, opposing team, but Bradley Roby is going to be out for about a month. Uh, Jonathan Joseph missed last game might be out um, again for week seven. So they're without some of their top cornerbacks. And also, you know, you mentioned um, playing Minshew is a good contrarian play that if you want to fade Fournette in, um, in like uh, GPPs or whatever, like stacking him with Chark is obviously a really good play against the Cincinnati Bengals who let up a ton of, deep passes and big plays down the field so if you want to fade Fournette when most people are probably taking Fournette and stack a Minshew and a DJ Chark I think that's a good play Chark only okay. at six six thousand compared to you know uh, the production that he's put up should probably be a little bit more expensive but DJ Chark's one of those players that these types of websites the DFS sites always take a little bit longer to really buy into and start pricing them uh, accordingly now you brought up a couple of the Rams wide receivers and I think this is interesting because you named Cup and you named Woods I actually think the best play there is Cooks. Now, he's been pretty quiet. And when I think about this Falcons defense, they're also terrible. And they might be without Desmond Trufant again. He's been limited at practice. He's only been working with some of the trainers. Um, he's their top cover cornerback who would normally be lined up against a guy like Cooks. The Falcons defense is so bad. They, do, they get zero pressure on Jared Goff. And Jared Goff's weak point is when he's under pressure. He can't deliver balls when he's under pressure. And the Falcons are like a cure-all for that. They've had one quarterback hit over the last two games. I don't think they've had a sack over their last four games. So this seems like a get-right game for the Rams. If they're getting no pressure on a guy like Jared Goff, this seems like a good matchup for Cooks to finally be able to like utilize his skill set with his speed, get downfield, and maybe connect on one or two deep balls and you know, maybe not put up a performance like Stephon Diggs where you're like waiting for the explosion to happen, but maybe like a Stephon Diggs light and he can go you know, six for 120 and a touchdown or two scores. So I kind of like the Cooks – um, the Cooks play there is a guy who's kind of been forgotten on that wide receiver group just because the matchup is just so, so juicy. And we want to talk about paying down for wide receivers. What about Lazard in Green Bay or even uh, Jay Kumaro over there? Because we've had um, MVS mispractice. Devontae Adams is – I'm assuming he's not going to play because he's not practicing. John Allison, very, very little chance he's playing. So if all three of those guys miss time, like the next guys up are Jay Kumaro, is Alan Lazard, and it's crazy because Lazard, I think, had he had five targets and he only ran like nine routes or something last game. So he became Aaron Rodgers' go-to guy. He's going to be very involved in this offense. But Kumaral on the other side 
ran like three times as many routes. He was in there for like 80% of the plays and uh, Lazard's at $3,000. And I think that's probably the lowest you can get a wide receiver at. I'm not sure what Kumaro is at, but like these guys are going to be forced into a big target share from Aaron Rodgers. So I think if you're looking for a slot to fill in with just like no money left in your salary, I like both those guys because Lazard's, you know, 6'3", 220. He's got that prototypical size, speed, had college production. Aaron Rodgers, clearly after the game, if you watch the post-game conference, he was going, you know, he was like oozing about Alan Lazard. He's like, you know, I was sitting next to him. And uh, when we watch film, the guy is like really hardworking. And those are the guys that Aaron Rodgers loves. And those are the guys that he will feed because he trusts them to be prepared. So kind of like those Green Bay wide receivers over there. What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's crazy that we have to think of it that way because, like, Aaron Rodgers is someone where, like, narrative definitely carries a lot yeah, of weight yeah. with these guys. So, like, uh, like Kumaro, like, someone that, like, he ran, like, 65 of 74 snaps last week. Like, in theory, like, that one makes more sense. Right. But, I mean, just, like, looking over, like, and, like, whenever I don't know a ton about some of these other wide receivers like Lazard, I just go to player profiler and see what his comp is. Exactly. Kumaro's comp, David Nelson. Uh, but Marquez Colston is Lazard's uh, the closest comparable player so um yeah at 3k that's gonna allow you to do a ton with your roster especially if you think he's gonna get more looks um I, i'm kind of in on that i think that people are kind of uh talking about it enough to where by the end of the week i, I think he'll be a pretty popular way uh, to pay yeah. down just looking at any projection model right now he's gonna pop as one of the better values just uh based on being 3k alone um but yeah i mean uh anytime you get rogers that uh, kind of singing your praises in that way it's something we should definitely like take notice of so i'm in on that for sure yeah, it seems like anytime he comes out and like complains about a player not getting the ball, the next time he goes out there, you know, whether it's like 14 targets or 22 carries for Aaron Jones or something like that, it always ends up happening. And you have to assume after the performance that Lazard had, he's, he's going to get into nearly in every snap role if a lot of these guys uh, miss time. Let's shift gears to the last position we have not talked about yet, and that is the tight end spot. Now, we talk about Saquon Barkley practicing in full. Looks like he's ready to go. Ingram also missed last week. Um, he goes against the Arizona Cardinals, who everyone knows at this point are um, just a black hole when it comes to defending fantasy and tight ends. So he seems uh, is not even the most expensive tight end, but he seems fully healthy, right? Fully practicing 6,500 uh, against the Cardinals. He seems like he's kind of in a smash spot. Austin Hooper has been absolutely out of control. He's $1,200 less. Now, Mark Andrews becomes uh, interesting to me. You might look at the matchup immediately and say, like, ah, Seattle, it might be a little bit tough. But that's just because you probably have Seattle as like a team that you kind of want to shy away from in a sense. But they've given up, it says here on DK, um, the 29th most or reverse, I guess, the fourth most points to the tight end position in fantasy this year. And Marquise Brown looks like he's going to miss another game. And we have, I believe, like a two game sample size of or kind of like two game sample size of Mark Andrews playing without Hollywood Brown. Now, okay. week one, Hollywood Brown only played like I think it was like 10 snaps or 11 snaps or something. That was two touchdowns. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. He did. He did make a monster impact, but didn't have monster play time. Oh, yeah. Mark Andrews went nuts in that game. And then we saw uh, last week, Mark Andrews had another really big game without Hollywood Brown on the field. And uh, he's not back to practicing yet. So it seems like Mark Andrews against Seattle, who let up a lot of points, only 4,900, no Marquise Brown. That seems interesting. And then I feel like there's a lot of interesting, you know, tight ends here because Darren Waller, Oakland. Yeah. Um, they're going to be without Tyrell Williams again. He's dealing with that plantar fasciitis, so he should be a target funnel. Jimmy Graham without all those top wide receivers should be another guy who – that hasn't been good. He's been horrible, but he could, you know, kind of just walk his way into eight targets and a couple red zone targets. Um, we're looking a little bit further down. Not too many interesting plays that you want to pay down for. I would say Dawson mm -hmm. Knox has seen a big snap increase week to week. It's like 50, 55%, 58%, 65 75 Coming off the bye, they need playmakers to start doing things in that offense, and they have a ridiculously good matchup against Miami too. So that would be the one guy I would think about paying down for if you're trying to go a little bit contrarian because uh, he's a guy who's had on my radar for season-long weeks. I think he'll uh, end up walking his way into like streaming consideration going forward. But what do you think about the tight ends? Because there's, I think there's a lot of value all over the board. Yeah, yeah. T tight ends like really deep this week and that's not something that I, I, I normally say um, I, I think that just kind of circle back to what you're saying about Mark Andrews I think everything you said it makes a ton of sense I, I played him last week and a lot of people were kind of getting on me for uh, for not playing Austin Hooper obviously uh, but again like it's it's a situation where in, in GBPs if you can go uh, against kind of the grain on basically what everyone else is doing there's value in that uh, especially in some of these smaller field tournaments that I'm playing so uh, someone like Andrews like I, I get it like he he didn't hit the bonus on DraftKings by one yard so if you hit the 100 yard bonus that's a big difference he didn't get in the end zone but 
Uh, so Hooper gets in the end zone, hits the bonus. If like the play wasn't that much different, even if Andrews does one of those things, we're looking at Mark Andrews in a totally different light than we, we are uh, now after Hooper went nuts. So yeah, of course, um, Andrews with Hollywood out uh, makes, makes a ton of sense. I, I would actually argue that there was um, kind of out of points in favor of Andrews over Hooper last week, just because he doesn't have a lot of uh, competition in the red zone either. Hooper does. Um, you can make, I guess, Mark, In- Mark Ingram, if you want to get down to it in Baltimore, um, even Lamar on the ground. But uh, I love Andrews again this week for, for all those reasons, especially if Hollywood's out. Um, Evan Ingram, I would imagine, will be extremely chalky against uh, the Cardinals, of course. Uh, 6,500 is a big difference in price. I still think Evan Ingram is, is a great play. Um, I, I kind of uh, enjoy paying down for guys like Andrews, Darren Waller, these guys that are very talented and seeing huge target shares. Um, Darren Waller squarely in play again at 4,700. He's kind of priced down a little bit. Um, I think he's fine. Uh, paying all the way down for Hunter Henry at 4K is really solid as well. And and Hooper, like you said, like his target share is very safe for everything I just said about him. He's still very safe at that price of 5,300. I, I think all of those guys uh, you should have some exposure to if you're rolling out a bunch of lineups. Uh, one guy that I don't like, it's almost easier to say that at this week, at George yeah. Kittle at 6,700. Um, not really in on Kittle or the San Francisco passing game. We know they want to run a ton. Uh, this Washington team is not good. So um, I think that Kittle 6,700 is just someone that is, is priced out of DFS for me. If you really want to get a guy at lower ownership, fine. But I think enough people are going to go there. That if, he, if he's 10%, I don't think he's a great play. Um, I don't love the value at tight end this week. I'll say that. So I'm kind of with you on that. You could probably go to a guy like Jared Cook, 3,600. Maybe uh, go to someone uh, if you wanted to get really crazy. Darren Fells at 3,100. Um, but that's kind of where I'm at. I'm not going to Luke Wilson. I think totally different type of play than um, Disley was. He's all the way at 3K. Um, but I'm doing everything I can to get to this kind of high 4K range, I think, to get to Andrews, uh, Waller, that type of play. Yeah, that makes sense. And in order to get up to a more expensive tight end, we probably have to fade defenses, unfortunately. But, like, the only thing I want to say for this section is just Buffalo, right? Like, how you? I feel like you have to find a way to get Buffalo in there. But – Knowing the way you operate, I feel like – I mean, you'll obviously like San Francisco. Let me, let me take a guess on, the, on, a, on a, a defense that you probably like. I, okay. think, I think you'll have exposure to the Giants and I think Seattle. Yeah, I like the Giants quite a bit. We know Kyler will take sacks. There's going to be a lot of plays in that game. That's kind of my style. I will say one thing that's happened that's a lot different um, this year is they've kind of taken out that salary floor – um at the defense position so like last week we had the Jets defense the Cardinals defenses were sub 2k um so that that was something that I was super interested in just because it allows you to do so much um at other positions so like Miami I get it like you never want to play them in season long but they're 1500 they're playing against Josh Allen so on some teams um maybe going there would make some sense if they get you 10 points at 1500 like you're dancing at that point they could easily get you like negative three but I mean it's probably not gonna happen there's there's so much variance involved with with defensive touchdowns that I think you could go that route. Uh, I, am, I am on the Giants. I think they're a great play. Um, there, there's a couple people at, at defense that I think make a ton of sense this week. Uh, New Orleans uh, against Chicago, I think at 2,900, they're great. New Orleans is one of the, the most pressure uh, heavy teams in the entire league. Um, so not actively trying to target a team on the road, of course, and they are a slight underdog in this game as well. But uh, depending on who we get at quarterback, I think New Orleans is is squarely in play. And then I, I'm just kind of chasing around Minnesota a little bit just because I know how bad their offensive line is. Uh, they don't throw as much as I would like, but that's kind of trended upwards a little bit. So Detroit, uh, or uh, yeah, Detroit's pretty cheap as well, um, at, at least on DraftKings. Uh, they're one of the teams that, that I'd be targeting if I did want to kind of pay all the way down. 2300 seems like a decent price for them as well. You'll get them at way lower ownership than some of these other ones. Yeah, that makes sense. I, uh, I can't imagine – uh, having Miami in any in any of my season long lineups, so totally different game, huh? Yeah, it's kind of funny hearing you say that out loud. But yeah, there's a as always, there's a bunch of options on the defensive side of things, and if you're messing around with different lineups, you have uh, plenty of places to look in that sense. Um, so I think that pretty much wraps up the video for today. Um, any other words or general strategy you think for week seven that they should know? Uh, I think that's it. I think we, we've touched on it a couple of times, but anytime you have a, like a tiebreaker in DFS, it's almost always better to kind of uh, err on the side of playing the guy in the later game. It just gives you a lot more flexibility, right? So if you end up on a guy like Mike Williams uh, for the Chargers, you could, in theory, just pivot away to someone that's lower owned if your lineup's really struggling. So I think that's something that people don't do enough of that I'm pretty aggressive with. Um, and then, yeah, as well, like uh, throughout the week, I'm doing these first look videos now. So if you want to dive into to lineups a little bit earlier in the week, I'll have a video up for 
for every position. Uh, I'm streaming it on, uh, live on Tuesdays, so definitely check that out. But uh, yeah, I'm going to have a lot more NFL content coming up uh, now that I kind of have my feet set with some of the other stuff I've been working on behind the scenes. So uh, scaling up the NFL stuff, man. Maybe I'll get to the one video per day like you here and there. Hey, man, uh, I, I don't wish that upon anyone. But uh, listen, for everyone that is, is really a, a DFS head, make sure you're going over to check out Joe's channel. Like he said, he's going to be diving into the lineups much earlier. These obviously come out on Saturday. So some of you guys, you know, whether you're busy that day or don't have time to get around to it in a one-day turnaround, make sure you're going to watch his stuff because he'll be talking about that stuff um, all week, right? So you'll be prepared by the time Sunday comes around. So go check out Joe's YouTube channel. Go follow him on Twitter. All of his stuff will be linked in the description as well as in the comment section down below. Thank you for joining us today, Joe, everyone in the audience. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to our channels if you are new, and we will see you next Saturday. Peace.